If you were not with us last Sunday, I started a three-part series. Today will be the second part on the fruit of the Spirit. And I want to show you, if you weren't here last week, something that I asked an artist friend to make years ago. It's just a small picture of how the Holy Spirit flows through our lives. And so this may be the first time in your life that anyone has called you a pipe. But the idea is that we are a pipe and the Holy Spirit is flowing freely through us. But if we begin to tolerate sin in our lives, the pipe gets smaller. The Holy Spirit has less freedom to be working in our lives, less latitude to be working in our lives. If we don't confess the sin, it gets bigger. We can also add ignorance in there. The pipe gets smaller and the pipe gets smaller. And pretty soon the pipe has no room for the Holy Spirit relative to being reflected in our lives and Jesus Christ being reflected in our lives. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, we do not live this Christian life under our own power, but we live it under the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said it would be to your benefit that I go away. If I go away, I will send the Holy Spirit. And last Sunday morning, this morning, and next Sunday morning, we will talk, be talking about the fruit of the Spirit and what specific qualities the, fruit, the, the, the Spirit of God wants to be building into our lives. Now, as I told you last week, normally I work alone, but this is just a little test now. It's not the fruits of the Spirit, it is the fruit. It's not nine parts, I mean not nine fruits, one fruit with nine parts. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. By the way, I, I, I'm sorry it, it happened the first hour as well. It, it's, it's happening again. I'm, a, I'm allergic to some woman's perfume. <laughs> if you figure out who you are, just feel freedom to leave, but uh, you're, you're, you're going to see this a few times this, this hour. I'm sorry. Anyway, by way of review, last week I said that love is simply thinking of other people. Joy is having a deep belief that God is in control. This afternoon, if the 49ers beat the Cardinals, some of you are not going to be happy. But happiness is not joy. Joy is a deep-seated conviction that God is in control. We believe that Paul is correct in Romans when he said, we believe that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called to, according to his purpose. So even when life seems chaotic, we can have joy because we have this deep-seated conviction that God is going to be working through these circumstances. And then peace of mind is contentment in God. This is not some unrealistic attitude. It's just that we believe that God is at work. We learn to trust him enough and we're in the process of learning to trust him enough that we can be peaceful even when all around us is chaotic. I like to generalize by saying the first three parts of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, are sort of an internal working, and, and all nine parts are an internal working, but it, it's as though no one sees this happening in our lives because we're learning to give our lives to God to allow Him to be working in our lives. And now today we look at fruit that is expressed while interacting with others. And again, that's a generalization because this fruit is being developed inside us, but it's manifested more often than uh, love, joy, or peace. Jesus was talking, uh, was around a, a group of Pharisees, and they all sat down for dinner, and Jesus' disciples didn't wash their hands ceremoniously, which was taboo in that society, and the Pharisees got upset at Jesus. It's very interesting if you if you, if you look, turn to Mark chapter 7 and, and look at the whole story. But they didn't come to Jesus and tell him personally. They began talking around the fringes is what critics do. But anyway, Jesus answered their criticism by saying, it's what comes out of a person that defiles him. It's not what goes into a person. So he was trying to help them understand that his followers, not washing their hands, didn't have any effect 
on their spiritual lives. And we need to understand that, that it's what comes out of a person. We say that is original sin. I was visiting a doctor friend down in Tucson at the University of Arizona Hospital, and she had <clears throat> Toddler's Ten Commandments posted on her wall. First commandment, if I want it, it's mine. <laughs> Second commandment, if it's in your hand and I want it, it's mine. We understand that, don't we? Fruit of the Spirit includes love, joy, and peace. Love is thinking of other, peace and other people, but if I want it, I'm going to take it. Now, there are a lot of us who know about church and we know how to talk church and we know how to act church. Now, please understand, the people I'm talking about are not here at Bethany Bible Church. You understand that. They're at the Baptist Church down the street. <laughs> but sometimes, even though we know it all, we don't reflect Christ. So I, I like this cartoon. Someone sent it to me. And if you can't read it from the back, this is uh, St. Peter, and this is an actual depiction of how it is in heaven. He's got a desk exactly like that. And he's saying to this guy, and notice women, he's talking to a man, not women. Uh, yes, you were a believer, but you skipped the not being a jerk about it part. And we understand that, don't we? Some have all their doctrine down. They know every Bible verse. Every time we need our back pinned against the wall, there they are. But they're jerks about it. And so what I'm suggesting to you this morning is we want the fruit of the Spirit flowing through our lives so people see Christ reflected in life situations. Jesus says you're in the world but not of the world in John chapter 17, verses 14 through 16. You probably remember this. In John chapter 17, Jesus has the disciples with him. Judas has already betrayed him. And all of chapter 17 is a prayer. And he says to the Father, uh, protect them. They are in the world, but not of the world. And let's be honest, we're all affected by the society in which we live. And as I said uh, last Sunday, I I'd rather pay taxes in America than anywhere else. But we still live in an unchristian society. We are affected by the society in which we live. Let me give you a simple example. I never consistently ran red lights until I moved to Phoenix in 1995. <laughs> I didn't say I've never run a red light. I said I didn't run them consistently until I moved here. Because you know the philosophy here. Green means go, yellow means go, and red means two or three more cars. That's just what it means. <laughs> and one day it dawned on me as I was running a red light, I have been captured by the society here and realized that I was breaking the law. And so I quit doing it. My wife Susan was sitting over there the first hour and I turned to her and said, I quit it, didn't I, darling? And she shook her head, yes, up and down. But that's just a simple example of how we can be influenced by our society. And let's think about the current climate in which we live. If I don't like what you say, I attack you. If I don't like what you think, I vilify you. Truth is not necessarily important. We accept being mean to one another. I, w I was consulting a church and I was sitting with their, their elders and, and I won't name the company. I'll just call it General Electric, but it wasn't General Electric. You, you know the company and many of you would have their products in your home or your office. But these guys, it, it was like a wrestling match, the, 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 the way they were talking to one another. How the, these were all Christian men. They were leaders of this church. But the, the way they were talking to one another was just despicable. And finally, I said, say, guys, I've never seen a group of men, Christian men, treat one another the way you guys are treating one another. And one of the guys, now remember now, it's not General Electric, 
And, and, but this man said, well, if you think this is bad, you ought to see how we treat one another where I work at General Electric. And I said, well, we're not talking about General Electric. We're talking about the body of Christ and how the Bible tells us to live together and how we're supposed to treat one another. And, and you've been captured by the society in which we live. And I said, this is not right. It needs to stop. So, let's understand, this is the climate in which we live. And, and sometimes what we say in the Church of Christ, again, not here at Bethany Bible, of course, but the church down the street, is that we have someone who does not reflect the, the reality of Christ. And, and when you ask about it, someone will say, well, that's just the way he is. That's just the way Jack is. That's just the way Jill is. But I have a friend, he was a Southern Baptist pastor in Florida, and his son got in trouble with the law because of drugs. And so the judge saw potential, and he gave the young man his choice. You can either go to prison, or you can go to a lockdown treatment center. Which would you take? Prison or lockdown treatment center? And he took the treatment center because he had a real problem. And in this treatment center, rules are very important because any recovering addict will tell you that they are the most selfish people in the world. They live by no one's rules but their own in order to get the next fix. So one day this young man did something that probably most of us, most of us have done in high school, and that is he, it was lunchtime and he took a bread roll and he threw it across the cafeteria to try to hit a guy walking down against the wall. And that was against the rules. And after lunch, a number of his buddies came to him and said, we love you too much to let you get away with that. Isn't that powerful? We love you too much to let you get away with that. And they made him go to the young man that he tried to hit to apologize. And they made him go to the director or the superior, whoever it was, to tell him what he had done. We love you too much to let you get away with that. Pastor Joel in the video earlier this morning talked about the four key points of Bethany. The first one is connect. That, that we're to be together. We're to stand together. We're to help one another. Somebody said it years ago, we all have blind spots and everyone sees them but us. So as we look at the fruit of the Spirit, particularly now in the climate in which we live in our country, we, we need to ask ourselves the question, am I relating to people the way Christ would want me to relate? Let's look at patience. Patience, kindness, goodness. I apologize, and I don't think that lady has left yet. You are a very bad person. <laughs> Patience is not being unaware. Patience is not moving through life with your head in the clouds so you never see any inconsistencies in people's lives. The patient person sees the inconsistency. The patient person sees the imperfect person. The patient person sees the rude behavior. The patient sees the selfish. The patient person sees the selfish behavior. They just don't give in to it. Because the patient person has hope for the person regardless of the circumstances. One way, one way to look at it is that I, I see someone that's, whose behavior really is not attractive at all. And I have to ask myself the question in patience, is this person a problem or is this person a project? And you see, patience is related to love. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 13, the great love chapter, the Apostle Paul says that love is patient. So as we think about patience being loving, as we think about patience being love, as we think of patience relative to having hope for that other person, then we have to ask ourselves the question, do I really care for this person? Did God put this person in my life to help me help them get better? 
And also to ask ourselves the question, is this person in my life right now so I can rely more on God to say, dear God, here's a person with whom I can't be patient. I need your help. I need your strength. I'm not asking you to say anything out loud. I just want to ask you to just take a moment and think about this question. Who is it right now in your life for whom you struggle with patience? Who is it right now in your life with whom you struggle for patience? It's kind of a gutsy question, isn't it? Could be your mother, could be your father, could be your boss, could be a professor, could be one of your students, could be one of your kids, could be a neighbor. I don't know who it is for you. I know who it is for me. So the, the challenge this morning is just to ask ourselves the question, who is it with whom I have a difficult time being patient? And it's okay to admit that. A number of years ago, when Susan and I were still in the ministry of Campus Crusade for Christ, now called Crew, Dallas Theological Seminary in Dallas, obviously, had a program called Two Weeks in the Word, and leaders could, could take two weeks from the ministry and go to Dallas and study in the Word with different professors for two weeks. And a friend of mine was there, and he said it was the very last day, the very last session, and, and the professor, a, a well-known professor, had led them, and then he led them in prayer as the two weeks were over. And they were all in their knees in this classroom praying, and the professor began to pray. Now remember, these were all young men in their 20s and their 30s. And my friend told me that the professor was on his knees kneeling before a chair, and he prayed, God, don't let me become a dirty old man. And my friend Ken said he looked up and looked around and all these other young men were looking around and later talked and said, if he needs to pray that prayer, how much more do we need to pray that prayer? And it made a huge impact on these young men because here was the man they respected so much as a man of God and he was still saying to God, I need you to be at work in my life. I don't have this all figured out. So if we struggle with patience this morning, it's all right. It just means that God has more work to do in our lives. When I was pastoring in the suburbs of Minneapolis, I was much younger and, and most of our leaders were young men, but one of our elders was a man old enough to be our father. And we just revered him and we loved him and respected him so much. Every time we had something serious, about, we, about which we needed to pray, we always asked him to pray last because we had confidence that his prayer would fill in the gaps and he would have insights that we didn't have because of our immaturity. Now remember, he's old enough to be my father. I just thought the world of him. And one day he came to me and said, talking about some other older people in the church, he said, I am afraid that they think they have exhausted the inexhaustible book. In other words, they didn't, they, there was no more about the Bible that they needed to learn because they knew it all. And here's this man that was just a veritable saint in our eyes, and he's lamenting the fact that these brothers and sisters were acting as though they didn't need God to do any more work in their lives. So my challenge this morning is if, if you and I are struggling with patience, just admit it to say, God, there's another area where I need you to be working in my life. Kindness. Kindness is not just being polite. You, you and I can fake being kind. Uh, kindness is pleasant. But notice this. Kindness is an outward expression of goodness. And kindness and goodness go hand in hand. Goodness is not phony. It's a sincere attitude that's beneficial to other people. Let me say it again. I can fake kindness to you this morning. I know, I know all of the words. But my words of greeting to you, my words of kindness, my smile, that can all be phony. Just an act. But Paul is saying... That kindness, 
genuine spirit-filled kindness is an expression of my heart of goodness. They go hand in hand. Goodness is not phony. It's a sincere attitude that's beneficial to others. Goodness can be tough, but it's never nasty. Goodness is beneficial to others. It can be tough, but never nasty. Back to that lockdown treatment center in Florida, the day those young men came to my friend's son, they were showing goodness. They weren't nasty to him. They just said, brother, we love you too much to let you get away with this. I was speaking in Texas and two pastors were driving me from one meeting to another meeting. It turns out uh, both of them were recovering drug addicts. One of them converted to Christ in prison for selling drugs. When he got out, he became a drug counselor and pastor at a small church. So as they're driving, as we're driving, they're talking. The driver was, was driving and I was in the front seat and the other fellow was in the back seat. They were talking about this family and I was quiet, just listening. But they were talking about how a, a member of their family refused to get clean, refused to get any help. And their advice was to the family, don't let him into the house. Don't give him any money. Do nothing to help him. And then they used a phrase that I had never heard. One of them, I think the man in the back seat said, well, as you know, we told them they have to love from a distance. And I interrupted the conversation. I said, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know what that means. What does that mean? Well, they explained to me that they explained to this family, you continue to love your addict's loved one, but you don't enable him in any way you don't help him in any way and you tell him that because he's violated so many rules he's no longer welcome in your house and you say to him we will continue to love you but we will love you from a distance to help get his attention of what he's losing if he doesn't get clean the fruit of the spirit is patience kindness goodness it's not phony it helps other people. Let me show you a slide. This comes from Portland, Oregon in August. My brother invited me to a golf fundraiser. So I drove three hours from Bend, Oregon on the east side of the Cascade Mountains to Portland to meet my brother. And the car on the left is my wife's Toyota. 25,000 miles, and I pulled in beside this brand new Mercedes-Benz or BMW. Can't remember now. If you look, the license plate on that uh, BMW is an Oregon plate. If you look at the plate on my wife's car, it's an Arizona plate with a protective rim around it from Wright Toyota. And those are my golf clubs, ping golf clubs. Right, Toyota, ping golf clubs, buy local. So my brother wasn't there yet, and so I got out of my car to wait for him because I would see him drive in the parking lot. And I was standing against the back of the car, and it, it was a warm day, 85, I think. It, wasn't, it was Oregon, remember? It wasn't 170 like it was here. <laughs> so I stepped in by the driver's door and was leaning against the car in the shade waiting for my brother. It's my wife's car. I can lean against it if I want to. <laughs> and I hear a voice, please don't lean against my car. And I, I thought it was a friend of my brother's who knew who I was and I turned with a smile on my face looking to see who this guy was who would ask me, had my brother arrived yet? And it's Hitler's nephew standing there. <laughs> and I said, pardon? And he said, please don't lean against my car. Now what would you say? I said, it's my car. What I should have said is, if you want to trade the BMW for a Toyota, <laughs> I'll be happy to do that. But, but I didn't. 
I just said, it's my car. And he said, oh my goodness, I was looking at the wrong car. And I said, it's okay, we all make mistakes. Wasn't that a kind thing to say? Wasn't that a kind thing to say? <laughs> but what was in my heart <laughs> was, you're an idiot. <laughs> I, I, I'm not joking. You're an idiot. If you can't tell the difference between a BMW and a Toyota, you shouldn't be driving a BMW. <laughs> you're an idiot. And he was all apologetic, and I said, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. And when he wound down, I said, I have a question for you. Was I kind to you? And he said, yes, you were very kind. But four times during the round with my brother, this guy was some official that day, he came by and would stop. And four times I zinged him. I'm good at that. One time the fellow riding in his cart said of him, do you want to ride with him? And I said, change him for my brother? Not a chance. Well, a week or two later, I began thinking about this. It appeared that I was kind, maybe by society standards, but what Paul is saying here in the fruit of the Spirit is that kindness and goodness go together. If I'm thinking in my heart, the guy's an idiot, then I'm not being motivated by a heart of goodness, am I? I'm not being motivated with any motivation that would be of benefit to this man. And I realize that I failed the test. I'm smart enough and I'm good enough like, like you are. I can fake those words. But what Paul's saying when he says patience, kindness, and goodness is he's asking us to look to our hearts. So I actually had to think about that and pray about it and say, Lord, here's another area where I need you to be at work in my life, building more of Christ in my life through the power of the Holy Spirit. Because the fruit of the Spirit is not just expressing kindness, Fruit of the Spirit is thinking kindness and, and, and thinking goodness. It's very important. See, what God is after is what's going on on the inside of us. And that day I failed the test. And, and I have to tell you the truth, I, I'm glad it happened because I don't know that I had ever thought it through as clearly <laughs> as I thought it through after that happened. And I realized that I'm still imperfect and that God hasn't quit on me yet. Well, by way of personal application, and do you understand that a miracle might happen this morning here? I might actually quit a little early. I was telling you that. I might. But remember, this is the fruit of the Spirit, not fruits. Now we begin to undersee, we begin to understand and see why the Spirit of God motivated Paul to say it is the fruit of the Spirit. See, if there were nine fruits of the Spirit that day up in Portland at the golf course, I would have excused myself because I would have just ignored the goodness aspect and just said, I was kind to that guy. I didn't say anything wrong to him. But it's not nine fruits, it's one fruit. Secondly, am I patient or do I just fake it? And let me ask you again, again with, with nobody talking, nobody raising your hands. Who is it with whom you struggle to be patient? Just admit it to yourself and admit it to God. In your mind's eye, Say the person's name. There's nothing wrong with saying, God, I am weak, because when we are weak, he is strong. And if we can be honest about the fact that there are areas of our lives 
where we don't reflect Christ, then we give him the freedom to be at work in our lives. This is a tough one. Do my kind expressions reflect a heart of goodness? Do my kind expressions reflect a heart of goodness? And again that day at the golf course, I faked it. My expression was not reflecting what was in my heart. Do you know this issue of our heart is so important? And you do know this. I know you do. Jesus said, if we men look on you women with lust in our heart, it's as though we've already committed adultery. Jesus said, if we're angry with someone, it's as though we committed murder. That's how important our hearts are. And that's how important it is that we give our hearts to Christ and continue to let him be working in our lives. And then finally, a prayer. Let me read it to you once, and then I'm going to ask you to read it out loud with me, but say it as a private prayer. Dear God, please keep working on me. I have not arrived yet. That's profound, but it's simple, isn't it? Please keep working on me. I've not arrived yet. So would you just pray it with me? Dear God, please keep working on me. I have not arrived yet. And then let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the honesty of the word. Thank you for how you motivated the Apostle Paul to give us the fruit of the Spirit. And Lord, I know my own heart. I, I don't know hearts of others here. But give all of us the courage to tell you about the people with whom we struggle. People with whom we struggle with patience and kindness and goodness. And give us the courage to say, God, here's another place in my life where I need your help. Thank you that you don't turn your back on us when we take that step of honesty towards you. You take a step of honesty and help towards us. When we are weak, you are strong. I pray for my brothers and sisters this morning that we would be men and women who know love, joy, peace, and we manifest kindness, goodness, and patience, particularly in the tough society in which we live. And I pray this in the name of Christ.